First question is about 1948. For Israelis, 1948 is the establishment of the State of Israel and the War of Independence. For Palestinians, 1948 is the Nakba, which means catastrophe, or the displacement of 700,000 Palestinians from their homes as a consequence of the war. What to you is important to understand about the events of 1948 and the period around there, 47, 49, that helps us understand what's going on today and uh, maybe helps us understand the roots of all of this that started even before 1948. I was hoping that Norm could speak first, then Benny, then Wayne, and then Steve. Norm? After World War II, the British decided that they didn't want to deal with the Palestine question anymore, and the ball was thrown into the court of the United Nations. Now, as I read the record, the UN was not attempting to arbitrate or adjudicate rights and wrongs. It was confronting a very practical problem. There were two national communities in Palestine, and there were irreconcilable differences on fundamental questions, most importantly looking at the historic record on the question of immigration and associated with the question of immigration, the question of land. The UN Special Committee on Palestine, which came into being before the UN 181 Partition Resolution, the UN Special Committee it recommended two states in Palestine. There was a minority position represented by uh, Iran, India, Yugoslavia. They supported one state, but uh, they believed that if forced to, the two communities would figure out some sort of modus vivendi and live together. The United Nations General Assembly supported partition between what it called a Jewish state and an Arab state. Now, in my reading of the record, and I understand there's new scholarship in the subject, which I've not read, but so far as I've read the record, there's no clarity on what the United Nations General Assembly meant by a Jewish state and an Arab state, except for the fact that the Jewish state would be demographically, the majority would be Jewish, and the Arab state demographically would be Arab. The UNSCOP, the UN Special Committee on Palestine, it was very clear, and it was reiterated many times, that in recommending two states, each state, the Arab state and the Jewish state, would have to guarantee full equality of all citizens with regard to political, civil, and religious matters. Now, that does raise the question, if there is absolute full equality of all citizens, both in the Jewish state and the Arab state, with regard to political rights, civil rights, and religious rights, apart from the demographic majority, it's very unclear what it meant to call a state Jewish or call a state Arab. In my view, the partition resolution was the correct decision. I do not believe that the Arab and Jewish communities could, at that point, be made to live together. I disagree with the minority position of India, Iran, and Yugoslavia. And that not being a practical option, two states was the only other option. In this regard, I would want to pay tribute to what was probably the most moving speech at the UN General Assembly proceedings by the Soviet Foreign Minister Gromyko. I was very tempted to quote it at length, but I recognized 
that would be uh, taking too much time. Uh, so I asked a young friend, Jamie Stern Weiner, to edit it and just get the essence of what Foreign Minister Gromyko had to say. During the last war, Gromyko said, the Jewish people underwent exceptional sorrow and suffering. Without any exaggeration, this sorrow and suffering are indescribable. Hundreds of thousands of Jews are wandering about in various countries of Europe in search of means of existence and in search of shelter. The United Nations cannot and must not regard this situation with indifference. Past experience, particularly during the Second World War, shows that no Western European state was able to provide adequate assistance for the Jewish people in defending its rights and its very existence from the violence of the Hitlerites and their allies. This is an unpleasant fact, but unfortunately, like all other facts, it must be admitted. Gromyko went on to say, in principle, he supports one state, or the Soviet Union supports one state, but he said, if relations between the Jewish and Arab populations of Palestine proved to be so bad that it would be impossible to reconcile them and to ensure the peaceful coexistence of the Arabs and the Jews, the Soviet Union would support two states. I personally am not convinced that the two states would have been unsustainable in the long term if, and this is a big if, the Zionist movement had been faithful to the position it proclaimed during the UNSCOP public hearings. At the time, Ben-Gurion testified, quote, I want to express what we mean by a Jewish state. We mean by a Jewish state simply a state where the majority of the people are Jews, not a state where a Jew has in any way any privilege more than anyone else. A Jewish state means a state based on absolute equality of all her citizens and on democracy. Alas, this was not to be. As Professor Morris has written, quote, Zionist ideology and practice were necessarily and elementally expansionist. And then he wrote in another book, transfer, the euphemism for expulsion, Transfer was inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism because it sought to transform a land which was Arab into a Jewish state. And a Jewish state could not have arisen without a major displacement of Arab population. And because this aim automatically produced resistance among the Arabs, which in turn persuaded the Yeshuv's leaders, the Yeshuv being the Jewish community, the Yeshuv's leaders that a hostile Arab majority or a large minority could not remain in place if a Jewish state was to arise or safely endure. Or, as Professor Morris retrospectively put it, quote, a removing of a population was needed. Without a population expulsion, a Jewish state would not have been established." Unquote. The Arab side 
rejected outright the partition resolution. I won't play games with that. I know a lot of people try to prove it's not true. It clearly, in my view, is true. The Arab side rejected outright the partition resolution. While Israeli leaders acting on the compulsions, inevitable and inbuilt into Zionism, found the pretext in the course of the first Arab-Israeli war to expel the indigenous population and expand its borders. I therefore conclude that neither side was committed to the letter of the partition resolution, and both sides aborted it. Thank you, Norm. Norm asked that you make a lengthy statement in the beginning. Uh, Benny, I hope it's okay to call everybody by their first name in the name of camaraderie. Norm has quoted several things you said. Uh, perhaps you can comment broadly on the question of 1948 and maybe respond to the things that Norm said. Yeah. UNSCOP, the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine, um, recommended partition, the majority of UNSCOP recommended partition, which was accepted by the UN General Assembly in November 1947, uh, essentially looking back uh, to the Peel Commission in 1937. Ten years earlier, a British commission had looked at the problem of Palestine, the two warring uh, national groups who refused to live together, if you like, or um, uh, um, consolidate a, a unitary state, state between them. Um, and Peel said uh, there should be two states. That's the principle. The country must be partitioned into two states. This would give a modicum of justice to both sides, if not uh, all their demands, of course. Um, and the United Nations followed suit. Uh, the United Nations, UNSCOP, and then the UN General Assembly, representing the will of the international community, um, said two states is the just solution in this complex situation. The problem was that immediately with the passage of the resolution, uh, the Arabs, the Arab states and the Arabs of Palestine said no, as Norman Finkelstein uh, said. Uh, they said no, they uh, rejected the partition uh, idea, the principle of partition, not just the idea of what percentage which side should get, but the principle of partition they said no to. The Jews should not have any part of Palestine for their sovereign uh, territory. Uh, maybe Jews could live as a minority in Palestine. That also was problematic in the eyes of the, uh, the Palestinian Arab leadership. Husseini had said only Jews who were there before 1917 could actually get citizenship and con continue to live there. But the Arabs rejected partition and the Arabs of Palestine launched in very disorganized fashion war against the resolution, against the implementation of the resolution, against the Jewish community in Palestine. Um, and this was their defeat in that civil war between the two communities while the British were withdrawing from Palestine. Um, um, led to the Arab invasion, the, Ara the invasion by the Arab states in May 1948 uh, of, of the country. Again, basically with the idea of eradicating or preventing the emergence of a Jewish state in line with the United Nations um, decision and the will of the international community. No Norman uh, said that the Zionist enterprise, uh, and he quoted me, meant from the beginning um, to transfer or expel the Arabs of Palestine or some of the Arabs of Palestine. Um, and I think he's sort of um, quoting out of context. The context in which the statements were made that, that the, um, the Jewish state could only emerge um, if there was a transfer of Arab population was preceded in the way I wrote it and the way it actually happened by Arab resistance and hostilities towards the Jewish community. Had the Arabs accepted partition, there would have been a large Arab minority in the Jewish state which emerged in 1947. And in fact, Jewish um, economists and state builders took into account that there would be a large Arab minority and uh, it's uh, needs would be cared for, etc. Um, uh, but this was not to be because the Arabs attacked. And had they not attacked, um, uh, perhaps a, 
a, a Jewish state with a large Arab minority could have emerged, but this didn't happen. Uh, they went to war, the Jews resisted, and in the course of that war, um, uh, Arab populations were driven out. Uh, some were expelled, some left because Arab uh, leaders uh, advised them to leave or ordered them to leave. Uh, and at the end of the war, uh, Israel said they can't return because they just tried to destroy the Jewish state. Um, um, and, and that's the basic a reality of what happened in 48. Uh, the Jews created a state. The Palestinian Arabs never bothered to even try to create a state uh, before 48 and in the course of the 1948 war. And for that reason, they have no state to this day. Uh, the Jews do have a state because they prepared to establish a state, fought for it, and uh, um, established it um, uh, uh, hopefully lastingly. When you said hostility, in case people are not familiar, there was a full-on war where Arab states invaded and Israel won that war. Let me just add to clarify, the war had two parts to it. The first part was the Arab community in Palestine, its militiamen, attacked the Jews in, 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 from November 1947. In other words, from the day after the UN partition resolution it was passed, Arab gunmen were busy shooting up Jews, and that snowballed into a full-scale civil war between the two communities in Palestine. In May 1948, a second stage began in the war in which the Arab states invaded the new state, attacked the new state, um, and, and they too were defeated, and thus a state of Israel emerged. In the course of this two-stage war, um, a vast Palestinian refugee problem um, um, occurred. And so after that, the transfer, the expulsion, the the thing that people call the Nakba uh, happened. Um, Muyen, could you speak to 1948 and the historical significance of it? Sure. Um, there's there's a lot to unpack here. I'll try to limit myself to just a few points regarding Zionism and transfer. I think. Heim Weizmann, uh, the head of the World Zionist Organization, had it exactly right when he said that the objective of Zionism is to make Palestine as Jewish as England is English or fr France is French. Um, in other words, um, as, as Norman explained, um, a Jewish state requires Jewish political demographic and territorial supremacy. Without those three elements, um, the state would be Jewish in name only. And I think what distinguishes Zionism is its insistence, supremacy and exclusivity. That would be my first point. The second point is um, I think what the Soviet foreign minister at the time, Andrei uh, Gromyko said is exactly right. <laughs> with one reservation. Um, Gromyko was describing a European savagery unleashed against Europe's Jews. At the time, you know, it wasn't Palestinians or Arabs. Uh, the savages and the barbarians were European to the core. Um, it had nothing to do with developments in Palestine um, uh, or the Middle East. Secondly, at the time that Gromyko was speaking, um, those Jewish uh, survivors of the Holocaust and, and others who were in need of safe haven were still overwhelmingly on the European continent and not on Palestine, not in Palestine. And I think um, given um, the scale of the savagery, I don't think that any one state or country um, should have borne the responsibility uh, for addressing this crisis. I think it should have been an international uh, responsibility. Um, the Soviet Union could have contributed. Germany certainly could and should have uh, contributed. Um, the United Kingdom and the United States, uh, which slammed their doors shut to um, uh, the persecuted Jews of Europe as the Nazis were rising to power they certainly should have uh, played a role. But instead, what passed for the international community at the time decided to partition Palestine. 
And here I think we need to um, uh, judge the partition resolution against the realities that obtained at the time. Um, two, two thirds of the population of Palestine was Arab. Uh, the Yeshuv, the Jewish community in Palestine, constituted about one third of the total population and controlled even less of, um, of, of the land uh, within Palestine. As, as a preeminent Palestinian historian, uh, Walid al-Khalidi has pointed out, the partition resolution in giving roughly 55% of Palestine to the Jewish community um, and I think 41, 42% uh, to the Arab community, to the Palestinians, did not preserve the position of each community or even um, uh, favor one community at the expense of the others. Rather, it thoroughly inverted and revolutionized uh, the relationship uh, between, between the two communities. And as many have written, the Nakba was the inevitable consequence of partition given the nature of Zionism, um, given the territorial disposition, given the weakness of the Palestinian community whose leadership had been largely de uh, decimated during a major revolt at the end of the 1930s, um, given that the Arab states uh, were still very much under French and British influence. Um, uh, the Nakba was um, inevitable, the inevitable product of the um, partition uh, resolution. And, and one last point also about um, the, the UN's partition resolution is, yes, um, formally that is what the international community decided in, on the 29th of November 1947. It's not a resolution that could ever have gotten through the UN General Assembly today for a very simple reason. It was a very different General Assembly. Most African, most Asian states, um, were not yet independent. Um, were the resolution to be placed before the international community today, and I find it telling that um, uh, the minority opinion was led by India, Iran, and Yugoslavia, I think they would have represented the clear um, uh, majority. So partition, given what we know about Zionism, given that it was entirely predictable what would happen, given um, uh, the realities on the ground in Palestine, um, was deeply unjust. And the idea that either the Palestinians or the Arab states could have accepted um, such a resolution is, is I think, um, uh, an illusion. That was in 1947. We saw what happened in 48 and 49. Palestinian society was essentially um, uh, destroyed. Over 80%, I believe, of Palestinians resident in the territory that became the state of Israel were either expelled or fled uh, and ultimately were ethnically cleansed because ethnic cleansing consists of two components. It's not just forcing people into refuge or expelling them. It's just as importantly preventing their return. And here, and, and, and Benny Morris has written, I think, an article about Yosef Weitz and the transfer committees. Um, there was a very detailed initiative to prevent their return, and it consisted of raising hundreds of Palestinian villages to the ground, which was systematically implemented, and so on. And so Palestinians became a stateless people. Now, um, what is the most important reason that no Arab state was established um, in Palestine? Well, since the 1930s, um, the Zionist leadership and um, the Hashemite um, uh, leadership of uh, Jordan, as has been uh, thoroughly researched and written about by the Israeli-British historian Avi Shlaim, essentially colluded um, to prevent the establishment of an independent Arab state um, in Palestine uh, in the late 1940s. Um, there's, there's much more here, but I think um, those, those are the key points I, I would make about uh, 1948. We may talk about Zionism, Britain, UN assemblies, and all, it, all the things you mentioned, there's a lot to dig into. So again, 
if we can br keep it to just one statement moving forward sure. a a after Stephen, if you want to go a little longer. Uh, also, we should acknowledge the fact that the speaking speeds of, of people here are different. Stephen speaks about 10 times faster uh, than me. Uh, Stephen, do you want to comment on 1948? Yeah, I think it's interesting where people choose to start the history. Um, I noticed a lot of people like to start at either 47 or 48 because it's the first time where they can clearly point to a catastrophe that occurs on the Arab side that they want to ascribe 100% of the blame to the newly emergent Israeli state to. Uh, but I feel like when you have this type of reading of history, it feels like the goal is to moralize everything first and then to pick and choose facts that kind of support the statements of your initial moral statement afterwards. Um, Whenever people are talking about 48 or the establishment of the Arab state, uh, I never hear about uh, the fact that a civil war started in 47 uh, that was largely instigated because of the Arab rejectionism of the 47 partition plan. Uh, I never hear about the fact that the majority of the land that was acquired happened by purchases from Jewish organizations of uh, Palestinian Arabs of the Ottoman Empire before the mandatory period in 1920 even started. Um, funnily enough, King Abdullah of Jordan uh, was quoted as saying, the Arabs are as prodigal in selling their land as they are in weeping about it. Uh, I never hear about the multiple times that Arabs rejected partition, uh, rejected living with Jews, um, rejected any sort of state that would have even uh, had any sort of Jewish exclusivity. It's funny because it was brought up before that the partition plan was unfair, and that's why the Arabs rejected it, as though they rejected it because it was unfair, because of the amount of land that Jews were given, and not just due to the fact that Jews were given land at all, as though a 30% partition or a 25% partition would have been accepted, when I don't think that was the reality of the circumstances. I feel like most of the other stuff has been said, but I, I noticed that um, whenever people talk about 48 or the years preceding 48, um, I think the worst thing that happens is there's a, there's a cherry picking of the facts where basically all of the blame is ascribed to this, uh, this built in idea of Zionism that because of a handful of quotes or because of an ideology, we can say that transfer or population expulsion or the, the, basically the mandate of all of these Arabs being kicked off the land was always going to happen when I think there's a refusal sometimes as well to acknowledge that regardless of the ideas of some of the Zionist leaders, there is a political, social and military reality on the ground that they're forced to contend with. And unfortunately, the Arabs because of their inability to engage in diplomacy and only to use tools of war to try to negotiate everything going on in mandatory Palestine, basically always gave the Jews a reason or an excuse to fight and acquire land through that way uh, because of their refusal to negotiate on anything else, whether it was the partition plan in 47, whether it was the uh, the Lusain peace conference afterwards, where Israel even offered to annex Gaza in, in 51, where they offered to take in 100,000 refugees. Every single deal is just rejected out of hand because the Arabs don't want a Jewish state anywhere in this region of the world.